Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is vacuum circuits. Our objective is to examine vacuums in pneumatic systems. We'll discuss how vacuum conditions are measured, how vacuum is generated, and lastly, how vacuum is employed. Viewers are no doubt aware there exist two conditions of measuring pressure, relative to the surface of the earth, a gauge measurement, or relative to the vacuum of space, an absolute measurement. The easiest way to compare and contrast these two systems is to place the absolute and gauge scale side by side. The absolute scale begins at vacuum conditions at zero PSI absolute, whereas the gauge scale begins at atmospheric conditions. A reading of zero PSI gauge is therefore equivalent to 14.7 PSI absolute. Unless explicitly stated otherwise, one can always assume all pressure measurements use the gauge scale. Pressures below zero PSI gauge or 14.7 PSI absolute will be vacuum conditions, i.e. pressures less than atmospheric condition the topic of today's lecture. Vacuums, spelled V-A-C, two U's, M, really suck and can be used in industrial settings to pull objects using the power of suction rather than to push them as would a linear acting cylinder. If the world was logical and efficient, one would just measure vacuum strength using these same scales. For example, if one aimed at center of mass of vacuum conditions, you could say this was 7.35 PSI absolute. Or if one had strong effective for the gauge scale, one could say the same vacuum is negative 7.35 PSI gauge. Either one of these two measurements would be a very workable means of measuring vacuum and wouldn't necessitate archaic or convoluted explanations. Understandable as this may be, it often doesn't work that way. Vacuum measurements use something totally archaic. And if that wasn't bad enough, they take an archaic measurement and flip it on its head. Allow me to demonstrate. Way back when people still wore powdered wigs and tights, some scientists by the name of Torricelli thought it'd be cool to fill a glass tube with a poisonous liquid metal mercury, known in those days as quicksilver or hydrogyrum, hence the symbol HG, and invert it in a bowl. He found that at atmospheric conditions, i.e. 14.7 PSI absolute or 0 PSI gauge, the atmosphere exerted enough force in the pool of mercury to push it roughly 30 inches high in the tube, 29.92 inches to be exact. If the atmosphere exerted more pressure, it forced the column of mercury higher, and if the atmosphere exerted less pressure, it draw the column of mercury lower. This is largely the working principle of a barometer, a device that measures subtle fluctuations in atmospheric pressure used to predict sunny days, rainy days, bomb cyclones, and mega droughts. Torricelli's setup also made a great way of measuring vacuum with atmospheric conditions as the upper bounds and perfect vacuum as the lower. At atmospheric conditions, i.e. 14.7 PSI absolute or 0 PSI gauge, the column of mercury was roughly 30 inches high. Theoretically, a perfect vacuum, i.e. 0 PSI absolute, or negative 14.7 PSI gauge, wouldn't support any mercury, giving us a lower bounds of 0 inches of mercury. Halfway up, i.e. 7.35 PSI absolute, or if you had special affection for the gauge scale, negative 7.35 PSI gauge, the atmosphere would support a column of mercury halfway up the tube, or roughly 15 inches. As archaic as this absolute height measurement is, you can see how it works, and you'd think people would just run with this, right? Wrong. Folks said, nah, uh that's still too easy. Let's take this unnecessary level of historical complication and really obfuscate it by standing it on his head. Thus, we have today's vacuum scale where zero inches of mercury is atmospheric conditions and 30 inches of mercury a perfect vacuum. I should note, if you live in a country with a working government and a functional healthcare system, most likely the vacuum scale is specified in millimeters instead of inches. Where zero millimeters of mercury, is atmospheric conditions and 760 millimeters of mercury is a perfect vacuum. Stronger vacuums have higher readings. Weaker vacuums have lower readings. If you want to think of it this way, the vacuum scale is not reading the height of the column of mercury anymore, but rather how much mercury gets pulled out of the tube by vacuum conditions. Atmospheric conditions don't suck any of the mercury out of the 30 inch tube, thus it gets a vacuum scale reading of zero. A perfect vacuum, in contrast, sucks all 30 inches of mercury out of the 30 inch tube, thus it gets a vacuum scale reading of 30 inches. Unit conversion between gauge, absolute, absolute height, and vacuum scales is possible, but it's tricky. Now, before you say, forget this noise, I'm going to just look this up on the internet, a word of caution about online conversion utilities. For the most part, these utilities are great for common units, however, some of them really suck pardon the pun, with a vacuum scale, it will spit out units of absolute height when you're looking for vacuum scale, PSI gauge when you're looking for PSI absolute, and vice versa. 
Long story short, don't trust nobody, never. Trust yourself, trust the math. If you think about it, we're dealing with four linear scales. Gauge pressure that starts at atmospheric conditions and goes up as pressure goes up. Absolute pressure that starts at vacuum conditions, which also goes up as pressure goes up. Absolute height that also starts at vacuum conditions, which also goes up as pressure goes up. And finally, the vacuum scale, which starts at atmospheric conditions, however, goes up as pressure goes down. Let's say we've got 12 inches of vacuum expressed using the vacuum scale. We want to express the same value using the absolute scale. This takes a couple steps. Vacuum scale to absolute height scale, then absolute height scale to absolute pressure. To convert from the vacuum scale to absolute height scale, one needs to flip-flop the reading. 12 inches of vacuum means the 30-inch column of mercury moved down 12 inches, thus 30 minus 12 or 18 inches remains. Now it's just regular unit conversion, where 14.7 psi absolute is equal to 30 inches, 29.92 inches to be exact. The unit we want psi absolute is on top. The unit we don't want inches of mercury is on the bottom. The units we don't want cancels out. We're left with roughly 8.8 .8 psi absolute. If you wanted to keep going with this and express this using the gauge scale, you'd be below zero psi gauge or in negative territory, which makes a perfect sense because it's a vacuum, i.e. something less than atmosphere, where 8.8 .8 psi absolute is roughly equivalent to negative 5.9 psi gauge. We can also perform these conversions in reverse. Let's say we've got an absolute pressure of 4 psi absolute. And we want to express this less than atmospheric condition using the vacuum scale. Absolute pressure to absolute height is a simple unit conversion, where again, 14.7 psi absolute is equal to 30 inches, 29.92 inches to be exact. The unit we want, inches of mercury is on top. The unit we don't want, psi absolute is on the bottom. Units we don't want cancels out. We're left with roughly 8.1 inches of mercury expressed using the absolute height scale. Now flip-flop this to express the same value in the vacuum scale. An absolute height of 8.1 inches of mercury means the 30-inch glass tube has roughly 30 minus 8.1 or roughly 21.8 inches of empty space. Now I don't like this wonky conversion any more than you, but we are stuck with it. Matter of fact, I dislike these conversions so much, you most likely won't see these on a quiz or an exam. But you might see this. Which of these measurements is the strongest vacuum? Zero PSI gauge. 14.7 psi absolute, an absolute height rating of 29.92 inches of mercury, a vacuum scale rating of zero inches of mercury, a gauge rating of negative 14.7 psi gauge, an absolute reading of zero psi absolute, an absolute height rating of zero inches of mercury, a vacuum scale rating of 29.92 inches of mercury, and just to make it fun, negative 0.1 bars, 10 psi absolute, two inches of mercury in the absolute height scale, and 28.5 inches of mercury in the vacuum scale. Again, I'm not asking for numerical results or unit conversions. All I'm asking you is to get a general idea of what is and what is not a strong vacuum. If you're up to the challenge, think you could order this list weakest to strongest vacuum? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. A couple of these should be super easy. The first four measurements all express the same atmospheric, i.e. no vacuum condition. 0 psi gauge, 14.7 psi absolute, 30 inches of mercury in the absolute height scale, and 0 inches of mercury in the vacuum scale are all weak, essentially non-existent vacuums. The next four measurements all express the same perfect vacuum condition. Negative 14.7 psi gauge, 0 psi absolute, 30 inches of mercury in the absolute height scale, and 0 inches of mercury in the vacuum scale are all super strong, perfect vacuums. Although unit conversion is always an available option, the next measurements can be ordered with a little thought. Negative 0.1 bars is expressed using the gauge scale. What's a bar? A bar is 14.5 psi. So 0.1 bar is roughly 1.45 psi. So negative 0.1 bar is roughly negative 1.5 psi or something 1.5 psi lower than atmospheric conditions around 13.2 psi absolute. It's not a huge differential, so this is a pretty weak vacuum. 10 psi absolute is about two thirds of the way up to an atmospheric condition, so it's also a pretty weak vacuum, but stronger than no vacuum. Two inches of mercury in the absolute height scale means 28 inches of mercury got sucked out of the 38 inch tube, so this is a pretty strong vacuum, although not as strong as a perfect vacuum.
Lastly, 28.5 inches of mercury in the vacuum scale means 28.5 inches of mercury got sucked out of the 30 inch tube, leaving roughly only 1.5 inches. Thus, it's an even stronger vacuum than 28 inches, but yet not as strong as a perfect vacuum. I should mention there exist vacuum gauges similar to pressure gauges, only vacuum gauge measure vacuum strength. The schematic symbol is indistinguishable. For obvious reasons, most vacuum gauges shouldn't be hooked up to pressure above atmosphere, nor should regular pressure gauges be hooked up to vacuums. Modern vacuum gauges sure beat using an upended tube of poisonous liquid metal. All right, enough of this. Let's put aside the foolishness of vacuum measurements for a bit and quickly discuss how vacuums are generated and employed in pneumatic systems before we call it a day. One of the easiest ways of creating vacuum is using Boyle's Law, which if you remember correctly is expressed as P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. A lot of the times, Boyle's Law in pneumatic systems is applied to the act of compression, i.e. reduction in volume. If you reduce volume, pressure increases. Boyle's Law also works in reverse. If you increase volume, pressure decreases. Consider an open-end cylinder with a piston at the top at atmospheric conditions. If the piston is pulled forcefully downward, volume in the cylinder increases and pressure in the cylinder decreases. Given we start at atmospheric conditions, any increase in volume and consequent reduction in pressure makes the expanding cylinder a vacuum or less than atmospheric conditions. Environmental air outside the cylinder at atmospheric pressure is pulled into the less than atmospheric cylinder what I've described as a suction action of a reciprocating compressor. In fact, the suction end, i.e. the inlet of a compressor, is essentially the working basis of something called a vacuum pump, where an arrangement of inlet and outlet valves allows a reciprocating or rotating vacuum pump to continually perform the suction action. We can observe this suction effect using two double acting cylinders. The cap end of cylinder A is open in environmental air. Similarly, the rod end of cylinder B is open to environmental air. The rod end of A is hooked to the cap end of B. As I pull the rod of cylinder B out, I increase volume in cylinder B's cap end, thus reducing its pressure below atmosphere. Atmospheric pressure acting on the cap end of A pushes A such that A similarly extends. You may wish to rewind that last part and listen closely. What extends A is not the less than atmospheric conditions on the rod end but rather the higher atmospheric pressure on the cap end. All the vacuum does is pull out support from the rod end, and the atmosphere is what actually does the work. Another way to generate a vacuum is with a component called, appropriately enough, a vacuum generator. A vacuum generator is schematically represented as a cone or a restriction with a pressurized input and an exhaust. As air speeds up to cram through the narrow restriction of the vacuum generator, it sucks in environmental air through the V-port, creating a negative pressure. Here I've set up a vacuum generator with a vacuum gauge in the V port and a pressure gauge on the P input. I like this particular vacuum gauge because it doesn't measure vacuum using the somewhat dodgy vacuum scale in units of inches of mercury, but rather much simpler negative bar readings. With 2 bar at the pressurized input, looks like we're generating negative 0.25 bar of vacuum. If I increase pressure at the input to 4 bar, looks like we're generating just shy of negative 3.8 bar of vacuum. Long story short, Increased input pressure and flow rate results in stronger vacuum with understandable limitations. Vacuum generators often use the pretty handy actuator called a vacuum cup or suction gripper. Vacuum cups might be used as the end effector for a robot or some other load handling device. Here's an example of a load handling device featuring suction grippers to manipulate large heavy sheets of glass. Sure beats struggling with this load yourself. Here's a simple circuit featuring a vacuum generator and suction gripper. Vacuum on it sticks, vacuum off it drops. To reiterate an earlier fine point, it's not necessarily the suction directly holding the object in place, but rather because there's less than atmospheric pressure on one side of the object, the atmosphere itself is pushing the object to the suction gripper. For load handling purposes, without complicating it too much, the stronger the vacuum produced by the vacuum generator and the larger the surface area are of the suction gripper, the larger the load it can lift. All right, that's all I got for you today. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the somewhat confusing vacuum scale and explored ways to generate and use vacuums in pneumatic systems. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.